All right, so we also wanted to do a quick discussion of our traffic analytics algorithm. Uh, Raj mentioned in the beginning, it's come a long way and we wanted to give you sort of a history of our thought process in building out the algorithm and also improvements that we've made over the time. So if any of you have seen the Meraki dashboard before, you've seen that we spent a lot of time uh, really making this data extremely useful if you're looking at who is connecting to the network, what applications they're using, and giving you rich, detailed information about the clients that are connecting to the network and what they're doing. And really the goal of a traffic analytics information is to help understand this user behavior better so that you can make smarter decisions about how the network is being used, make better decisions about traffic, shaping rules that you apply, and also to ident identify problems in the network. So you can understand what is a common day look like in your network, so you can really easily see if there are situations that are out of the norm, understand outliers from that uh, regular base level of the network operation. So talking you through what our existing traffic analytics had been, it's actually pretty simple. Here we have just a list of rules. You make a list of rules easily based on the traffic that we know is in the network. You count the number of bytes, and then you can update signatures as these traffic uh, rules change and as new websites become more and more popular. If you look at this a little closer, uh, this is essentially what it is. The firmware is grabbing information from TX and RX, and it's storing this information in RAM. So in this example use case here, 48 bytes per rule, if we assume 100 clients and 200 rules, we end up with, with about 960 kilobits of data stored in RAM. So the problem with this is that it scales linearly. As soon as we add more rules, we need more data to store that information. So we realized that we needed to really upgrade the way that we store information and analyze data. So in that initial example, if we had a use case with just six rules, we'd create a pie chart with six rules. And this is an example of maybe what data might look like in the existing algorithm. And you'll notice some things that are lacking in this type of analysis. For instance, we have this other section that's not really giving us any useful information. It's pretty unsatisfying. It also, as I mentioned, scales linearly. And it's telling us what we already know about our traffic. It's not going to be learning about any new changes in the network. So we wanted to rethink the way that we built this engine. And there are a few things that we thought about when we were doing this. First, taking a step back and just taking a look at what web traffic really looks like, the dis distribution of websites. So here we have on the left, very commonly accessed websites, and then this huge long tail of websites that aren't accessed as commonly. And this is pretty useful. We, we have rules for these things already, but we also, whoops. I'll log out. Great, so yeah, we have use cases or rules for these things already, but we don't have rules for this huge long tail of data that's actually very, very useful, and we want to know those other websites also. These popular sites are also changing all the time. Uh, here's just showing a list of over time popularity of some of these most common websites that we all use and are using right now, WFD7 hashtag. And so here we have you know, Facebook, obviously, but these aren't always going to be the most common websites. In fact, from day to day, the most popular ones change pretty often. And the last thing that we wanted to take into consideration was not all traffic is web traffic. We want to see an entire view of what's happening on our network, from the edge of our network, all the way through our switches to the access points and down to the end clients. So this is just a screenshot really quickly of our switch network. Here we have these huge spikes of traffic in the middle of the night every night, and we can easily see here that it is iSCSI traffic. So we know we're doing a backup every night. This is expected behavior. It also tells us if there's something not happening here, if it's not iSCSI traffic, and it's making a spike that big, it's probably something we need to take a look into. So we want to be accounting for all of these things in our new traffic analytics algorithm. So I'm going to turn it over to Raj to talk to you about how we built out this logic. Thanks, Katie. So just to summarize what Katie said, we had our existing way of running traffic analysis patterns, and we had simple signatures as well as some heuristic space signatures for things like BitTorrent. But as we know, the number of apps is constantly changing. The websites that people browse varies from organization to organization, and there's a very long tail end. So how do you capture all of that without kind of just, just giving broad categories like other or web. 
right? So that's kind of what was driving some of this thinking. Um, and I think one of the key drivers was we were in a couple of POCs with large scale enterprise companies and they said, 80% of my traffic is going to my internal mail server and it's just showing up as other in the, in the pie chart. And I would love to be able to see where that traffic is actually going. So that's kind of what drove a little bit of this development. So um, obviously when you're trying to capture a very long tail end of apps you have a, and you have a limited amount of memory because all the processing is done at the edge, there's a number of technical constraints, right? So let's talk about the problem in terms of those constraints and then how we overcame those constraints. So you have a stream of X elements, right? You're talking about thousands of websites, tens of thousands of websites and apps. How can we give you a list of those elements and have that list update dynamically, right? So instead of um, looking at a CDN uh, host name and saying, oh, this falls into other and just giving you other, how do we actually give you the list of 100 CDN host names, right? Um, some elements show up very frequently, others show up infrequently. Um, the stream could be infinite, right? In fact, it is an infinite stream. Uh, whenever you have hundreds of users accessing dozens of applications, you're talking about a very, very long stream of elements. So again, how do you, how do you factor all that into account with limited amount of memory? And finally, what if you want to track multiple aspects of an element? So not only do I want to tell you how many people went to this internal web server, but I want to tell you uh, how long they spent on that internal web server. I want to tell you what the IP address was, what the port name was. Um, so the solution is to keep a table of elements and their weights. Um, and basically, as you see elements um, increasing over time, as you see, let's say, 10 elements being hit um, versus one element being hit 10 times, you can increment those counters, and that way you're able to build a dynamic list over time. So looking at this a little bit more deeply, what we did was we said, let's completely redesign the algorithm, and let's actually use a distributed algorithm where elements are strings that, in, that encode new application parameters. So for example, some website X in Timbuktu, let's basically look at that host name, let's strip away some of the parameters within that host name, and let's create a new signature on the fly, and then let's encode additional parameters on top of that, right? So this allows us now to create new signatures dynamically based on a number of different parameters, HTTP ports, um, SSL information, host name information, DNS and IP information, right? And uh, because we have basically an object of, of n spaces, we're able to track signatures that show up at least one over n percent of the time, right? So what does that mean? Um, if you have a table of 10 elements, you're gonna end up capturing stuff that shows up at least 10 percent of the time. And in practice, you have a table that's far more extensive, right? So this allowed us to deal with a linearly scaling computation um, and also because you're talking about a, a database that's updating dynamically, you can add more rows to that database over time and you can track things like time spent, bytes in and out, number of users per signature, so on and so forth, right? So again, um, this basically facilitates the creation of a, of a di dynamic signature list, right? And this let us meet the requirement of customers saying, hey, I want to see more applications, I want to see more websites. And we'll take a look at it in just a second, but uh, one interesting point I want to make here is this is a little different than how kind of the traditional um, traditional kind of applica application classification process works, right? The traditional process is I'm going to analyze the traffic flow and I'm going to basically build heuristics on top of that so that I can then catch that traffic flow in the future, right? But this is notoriously difficult and it requires uh, basically a dedicated team to basically just continually be, be playing catch up as more apps are added over time, as more signatures are added over time. And in fact, BitTorrent itself is notoriously difficult to classify because it's using different ports, different IP addresses, right? So instead of kind of trying to play catch up, we wanted to create this dynamic scaling engine. So let's take a look at what this actually looks like in practice. I'm going to log in to the dashboard. And let's take a look at what this looks like for our HQ. So the traditional model was this list here, which basically shows me um, the top signatures, right? So Netflix, Vimeo, Google Video, YouTube, so on and so forth. But notice some of these broad categories that we mentioned. Miscellaneous web, miscellaneous video, non-web TCP. So how can we now give you more fine-grained analysis of all the different apps that are flowing within that? And that's where we have this new traffic analytics page. So this page basically now does a deeper level dive, and this is optional, so there's kind of three optional tiers. One is no analytics, one is the basic tier of analytics, and this is the kind of deepest tier. And now, as you'll see, 
we're basically now classifying additional data about each signature. So instead of now just telling you miscellaneous video, you can see the actual host name, Twitch TV. Instead of telling you non-web TCP, we're showing you that this is a corporate Meraki database. Instead of just telling you CDN, you can see that it's traffic to Akamai. Right? And not only can you see it's traffic to Akamai, but you can see that there's 47 flows to that CDN, active over 51 minutes, and there's one client accessing that CDN. Right? So this was fascinating to watch during the World Cup because we were able to see exactly which CDNs were being used and how many people were on each CDN and how long they were spending. Right? Um, and you can, and this, is, this is a great way to now get deeper visibility into where are people going. Right? Um, Apple, Apple websites. Um, a lot of mail.cisco.com, obviously, right? Because we now we use, we've been migrating over to the Cisco mail servers. And I can basically stack rank this based off time spent, based off the number of clients, um, so on and so forth. Um, and, and over time, this also lets us classify and figure out, okay, there's some host names or some websites that are just showing up so frequently, like WebEx, that we should just add a static signature um, for, for, those, for those websites. So fairly kind of compelling way to get that deeper level of visibility. And we've seen this being useful for, for, for network management. Because now what you can do is you can say, you know what, there's a lot of traffic to shortel.corp.meraki.com. I'm going to create a custom QoS signature so that I'm going to prioritize that traffic and I'm going to mark its, its queues appropriately. Um, or if you're a retailer and a lot of customers are coming into your store and going to competitors' websites, I'm going to layer 7 firewall off that website. Um, so again, uh, fairly, fairly kind of powerful functionality in terms of some of the use cases it can facilitate, some of the richer visibility. Yes, Keith? Between those three options of none, lightweight, or this, this detail, what's the, the penalty difference and where is that applied? Penalty difference in terms of just processing and... Well, you don't get it for free, so just wondering what, what the, why wouldn't you just dial it all the way up? Yeah, so actually uh, we, we've kind of designed the system in a way where we still have some spare capacity in terms of RAM and memory, so there, ne there isn't necessarily a performance hit. And in fact, we, one thing that I'll point out is if you scroll to the bottom of this page here, um, you'll see destinations with less than 0.1% of total traffic is excluded, right? So when we actually designed this, we found that when we were trying to capture that very, very long tail end, we were seeing a, a performance hit. So we, we added a cap so that we're not actually catching that very long tail end in terms of the 0.1% of network traffic. And that basically limits the, the C amount of CPU and RAM being used here. Um, so the other, the other interesting thing that I'll point out is you can opt people out of this. So network IT admins love this functionality, but the first request is always, hey, um, is there any way to turn this on for everyone except me? So we actually created a way to add a policy to a per user on a per user basis, and you can opt certain people out. So if you want to opt out your executive team, you want to opt out your IT team, you can basically opt people out. And also, this is functionality that we first added to our um, access points, but we um, applied it to our security appliances and switches as well. So imagine now performing this kind of deep packet inspection at switching line rate. It's very, very impressive. Um, I, I'm not sure if anyone else in the industry can give you this kind of visibility um, on a on a per switch on a per switch basis, and the last thing that I'll point out here before is you can actually uh, before you go on too far, um, BitTorrent traffic. What are you doing specifically to that? Because that is you know as you said earlier, um, highly evasive, and we used to be able to block it with you know some some port number blocking and, and blocking trackers that we knew of, but now they're moving away from trackers, and it's kind of whatever port I can get on, I'm going to go. Yeah. Um, how are you still able to do that with these tiny little packets of, of non-information? Yeah, so BitTorrent, um, it's, it's always been a cat and mouse game with BitTorrent. Um, BitTorrent, first we started off with just simple port-based classification. Then we added heuristics to say, okay, I'm going to look at a source, source IP and I'm going to look at whether or not it's communicating with a fleeting range of destination IPs that are constantly changing over time. Um, and then, obviously, as BitTorrent has, has evolved over time, we've been adding those heuristics over time to try to, try to keep up with it. So even now, if you look at kind of the, the hit rate of how effectively we can classify BitTorrent, it's constantly changing. Um, I would say it's probably about 80% effective right now, but that kind of changes over time. Yeah, that, that changes over time, and, and we're constantly trying to keep up with it. But the reality is that any time someone changes the application behavior, it breaks the heuristic, right? So instead of trying to constantly update the heuristic, that's why we created that, this new engine. Uh, the other thing that I'll point out here is you can actually, on a per-client basis, get that data as well. Um, so if I go into my iPhone, you can see, again, that higher-level information 
as well as specifically what apps I've been using, right? So Google+, Skype, iCloud, Tile, um, and some Amazon streaming, right? So again, great visibility not only at the network layer across all products, but at the per user layer. And this ties in nicely to some of the policy management and flexibility, the tools that we have per user, per network, per SSID, um, so on and so forth. So hopefully that, that gave you guys a, a little bit of a snapshot as to um, some of, some of uh, the logic behind how the traffic analysis works. And I think it's a, it's, a, it's, a good, it's a good way to hopefully get a flavor for how Meraki Engineering thinks, because it was a pretty, pretty kind of unique and radical way of approaching a, a classic problem, which all vendors have said, OK, let's just add hundreds of signatures. Let's just have a dedicated engineering team in-house, just add one more signatures. We said, no, you know what? Uh, there's always going to be internal corporate web servers and internal applications that we can't catch. Let's create this new algorithm that will uh, basically dynamically allow you to catch that long tail end. Uh, Raj? Yes. Uh, just for some of our viewers out there and people going to watch later, is, could you kind of um, explain like um, type of report or alerts generating that you guys can do uh, when clients are reaching maximum traffic like for um, certain applications and then yeah. we can kind of better understand um, how to scale the network. Right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So uh, we have a lot of basically policy management tools that you can use as your network scales and grows over time. You can leverage this information to say, I want to, for example, traffic shape Facebook. I want to throttle Netflix. I want to um, rate limit this one user because I know he's a football fanatic and I know he's going to spend all of his time on this website. I'm going to block just that website for that one user. So we have a lot of policy management tools um, and we obviously have the monitoring and reporting within the dashboard. We don't currently have alerts. So you can't, for example, set up alerts to say, okay, when this application is hit 100 times, send me an alert. That's certainly something that we could add right. easily over time. There, there, is, there are ways of exporting this data out. Um, so we do have large, larger customers who, for example, are um, exporting a, a list of all HTTP GET requests per MAC address in real time to their servers so that they can then monitor that. We had a, um, a school district that basically uh, was very concerned because some of their students uh, made threats against the US government. So what, the, what they're doing now is they're basically exporting out not only a list of URLs, but they're exporting out a list of all the TCP IP flows so that they're able to see exactly what are the source and destination IPs. And then, if, then they have this basically historic log of everything that happened. So in case there's ever a, a threat, they can basically retroactively go in and, and see exactly what happened. Right. And we're also monitoring like you know, um, AP usage. So we know for reaching some you know, maximums or you know, of data and whatnot. Yeah, so again, we have a lot of tools for monitoring AP usage. You can see the real-time traffic flows. You can see historic traffic flows. Uh, we don't have alerts on that just yet in terms of proactive, like, that hey, you... That would be good if you yeah. could do something like that. Yeah. No, absolutely. I, 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 think that's, yeah, I, I think that's good feedback, and that's feedback that we have been hearing, which is, hey, I just hit one gig of traffic on this AP, uh, and I'm in Europe, and I have data caps, and I want to receive an alert, right? So that's, that's, these are areas that we are looking at over time. Um, you mentioned that you can exclude um, some users by user. Can you also exclude by device? Good like question. In... The answer is yes. The way that you would do this is you can apply a policy by device type. So, for example, you have a thousand corporate issued iPads in your school. Mm -hmm. What you can do is you can create a policy that says um, traffic shape Facebook between 8 a.m. and 5 p.m. and also opt out of this richer host name level visibility. And then you can apply that on a per device type basis. You can apply it to Android devices, you can apply it to Chromebooks, you can apply it to iPads. Okay. Yeah. So some devices, you could say track all these devices, but don't track this one. Exactly. Okay. There's a lot of granularity in what you can do. It's per user, per device, per network, per SSID, so on and so forth. Thank and you. when will this show up in the production dashboard or is this available today? The traffic analytics? Yeah, yeah it's available today. Uh, you do have to switch it on. We don't turn it on by default because uh, it is a very rich level of visibility. So the kind of basic pie chart with the 100 or so signatures that we have is turned on by default. If you want that richer level of visibility, you can turn it on under the network-wide settings. 